right, all right. Happy Friday. Welcome to another Angular Nation session tonight. We have the Native Script team. We're very, very, very excited about this. Uh, before we get started, I want to give a quick shout out to our sponsor, AG Grid. Thank you so much, AG Grid, for helping us uh, make these conversations possible. Love AG Grid. Uh, and we love Native Script. Uh, so first i want to get started um introducing nathan walker and then nathan you can introduce the rest of your team if uh whoever you brought i know i see william in here how are you nathan good to see you again it's really good to see you i, I can't even remember last time we spoke not often enough though yeah it's great to talk with you yeah things are good it's it's nice to be at the end of the summer into the heat um sort of so yeah looking forward not to the fall <laughs> So I was talking to my friend, Tim Baldwin, and he was like talking and he was excited about stuff you were working on. So I reached out to you and said, I haven't seen you in a while. What are you doing? Can you, uh, well, first tell us if you brought anybody with you um, and then tell us what you guys have been working on. Sure, thanks so much. And by the way, thank you, Tim. Um, yeah, and everyone at, at UPS, uh, close to your friends, thanks for joining. Um, yeah, we have Ian McDonald here. He's on the native script TSC. So if you're not familiar with the term TSC, it uh, stands for Technical Steering Committee. It is a set of standards that uh, I think originated from the Node Foundation, which turned into OpenGS. But that terminology has probably been around for years, really just the formality around organization of large open source projects and how to manage them amongst teams um, around the world. So Ian McDonald's on the TSC. He is with us. Um, we also have, uh, let's see, uh, William Juan as well, who does a ton of stuff uh, around NativeScript 2. He's actually working on some pretty exciting stuff around Storybook at the moment. Um, and we know William. We, we love William. William is amazing. Um, we don't know Ian yet, in? but I bet we would love him too. Ian, I don't know if you want to say a quick word, um, maybe just where you're calling in from. Yeah, uh, well, calling from home because we all work from home now, right? Uh, but I'm <laughs> in uh, the the capital of Canada. That's a that's a all close right. question for you. Uh, yeah, so I'm on the the TSC. Uh, I'm, I really love NATO script. I find it's it's just the, the right answer to so many problems, and uh, yeah. Thanks for coming, Ian. We're glad you're here. Some quick about Eduardo, who is going to hop in. Um, he is in Brazil. He just traveled to Austin, Texas at the beginning of June. Um, first time he had been in the United States. Uh, first time I met him in person, we actually stayed in Airbnb for a week together there. It was amazing. He's a tremendous individual, just a heart of gold. Uh, the guy is incredibly talented. He's actually probably the primary one to thank for all the Angular uh, revisions with native script. He, he pretty much rewrote it from scratch. Um, and so he's He'd a be blushing if uh, he were here. Um, and he's gonna share something uh, with us here too that I think is, is very fascinating. It's probably something with native script that's never really been uh, talked about too much or gone into depth on. So he's gonna show something pretty interesting oh, there. Here he is. Well then definitely we need him. Yes, did, did he make it in now? He did. I just let him in. He should pop up here in a second. OK. Um, uh, what else good things can I say about Eduardo? Uh, the list goes on and on. When he was in the States, we went shopping everywhere um, because he wanted to buy his family gifts. And it was uh, one of his primary objectives when he came to the States is uh, go back home with gifts for his family. So really just a sweet guy. Wow. He sounds nice. And he, he spoke at OpenJS. Uh, we were there in Austin for OpenJS World. Um, NativeScript was submitted to OpenJS uh, last year or the year before. Can't remember exactly when, but um, great foundation, supports tons of all the open source software we all use out there, Webpack, for example, um, and just a tremendous group of people that are behind that foundation. And they do events all over the world um, all the time, and they're involved in a lot of different things. Um, but a lot of the Node uh, Foundation is uh, kind of the origins of that group. So uh, definitely a lot of Node discussions and a lot of security patches that the whole community depends on uh, is facilitated through that foundation. 
Um, Eduardo, hey, I was just- we have Eduardo. Eduardo, were your ears burning because he was talking about you? He was telling us all about you. Oh yeah, I imagine. <laughs> he told us your life story. He told us all your secrets. Is it true, Eduardo? <laughs> Maybe. If if I if I told you, I had to kill you. So. <laughs> Eduardo, you're gonna fit uh, right in. <laughs> I was telling them that really you are to thank primarily for a lot of the um, Angular. Uh, advancements and even refreshments because, um, you know, your knowledge of Angular is one of the more deeper sets of Angular knowledge, especially in terms of how it can be used in different host platform environments. So uh, I don't know if there's anything specific you want to share off the top there, but I was just talking about that. Uh, we are a bunch yeah, of Angular just... nerds. Yeah, so the the thing about Angular is just Angular is like so flexible. You can pretty much use it anywhere, and it's uh, like the the nice part of Angular is that uh, you barely need to do any adjustments. So, for example, if you uh, like, I, I'll, I'll say like the forbidden framework here. So, if you look at things like React that <gasps> use like TSX, for example, or JSX, uh, like there are other like uh, people on the team that use the React with NativeScript, and uh, to do that, you have to do like a bunch of custom stuff to like make sure that your JSX can compile to something that we can understand. It's not something that's only browser, for example. So it's kind of like a a, a lot of things, but uh, Angular just like gives you an API that allows you to pretty much do whatever you want and hand render it uh, like wherever you want, and even like use it on the server if you want. So uh, yeah, uh, Angular is just like amazing in that, that regard. Yeah, we like Angular too. <laughs> and Angular and Native Script have, like even when Native Script first came out, it just felt so much like, like because I was already using Angular and then I started using Native Script and it's just like it, it was already what I was used to. So it was just such an easy transition for me. It wasn't like I have to go learn something new. Just the, the API, but. It just feels very comfortable. I, I would say that's definitely the goal of the integrations is to definitely feel like you're in that flavor of choice. You know, if Angular is your uh, way to build apps that you, you want to feel as much in Angular as possible. I think the, the interesting part about NativeScript is the power is always there. You don't have to use it. Um, it's there when you need to use it and if you want to use it. Um, and that's sort of one of the Neat things about it probably is that um, it's kind of there as an option, um, but it's a, it's one of those options that is sort of indisposable when you encounter the situation where uh, otherwise it would have been pretty difficult um, to get around. And maybe that's a good segue to to share the screen and and touch on some of that for real. I, I think what over the years what's been hard to talk about with Native Script is a lot of things with it are hard to understand in discussion. Um, it's it's very much a hands-on type of thing to to understand what what is really happening there, um, and really what it is all about, and that's really why for probably the better part of the whole last year, um, we started this effort to revive uh, NativeScript Playground. So just some brief background: there had been a, a a playground around NativeScript for several years. I can't remember when it first uh, came out, maybe 2017. But it had, it had grown out of date over the past two and a half years. And we didn't want to just simply update it. We really wanted to re-envision the whole thing um, and, and think about a whole different way to, to tackle it. And um, primarily, you know, I think using something that already uh, was being used in tech documentation, uh, as well as just a tool that, that has been extremely useful, which is StackBlitz. And StackBlitz, of course, has been a pioneer, uh, definitely in the space with like web containers, which is really pretty revolutionary um, in the browser. And it really is what makes things like this possible. So a lot of credit to StackBlitz. Uh, we had them the, here the a whole couple team. weeks ago. We love Stack. Those guys are amazing. Just they're incredible. Another team and that's just like hiring all the cool people, and they're just having so much fun over there. And I love them. And it just, they come out yes. with stuff that's just like, wow, wow. Love it really is wow. I mean, it's wow to the point that it too is one of those things that's hard to talk about in discussion. Um, you almost have to see it to believe it. 
Um, and that that's very much kind of what we're looking at here because it uses exactly a lot of their advancements. You know, they web have done containers several are, impossible things. They like really you can't have. even do that. Oh, they did that. What? <laughs> How? What, what's really neat about this story with native script and stack blitz is it allowed uh, the stack blitz team to also see some other uh, angles with web containers that they had not yet tackled and were able yeah. to tackle by us collaborating on this. So it actually unlocked some additional doors that the rest of the entire community will benefit from, but um, very few would probably know it actually came from some of those insights and, and us working through this integration um, things in the way that sockets are dealt with. Mm -hmm. But we don't have to get too much into detail on how it's working in the browser. Um, but uh, what we're looking at is Stack Blitz. On the right is my phone. And uh, we're going to do a real hands-on example here. If, if uh, anyone has an iPhone, and I, and I do apologize, we're just going to focus on iOS here, uh, mainly because it's simpler to focus on one or the other. We could do both, but over the years, I've at least realized it causes more confusion in understanding some of the fundamentals when we jump back and forth between iOS and Android. Um, there's a lot of power in both realms, in both of which have their own world um, that are sort of infinite in depth. So, but we're just going to focus on iOS. If you have an iPhone, you can download the app from the App Store with this link. I'll share it in the... And I sent this link uh, out right before the call to, to the people who are SVP'd. So if you have this already downloaded, uh, drop a note in the chat and let us know. Maybe we'll make it interactive. That Yeah, that would be great. And once you have this app installed, so I'm loading StackBlitz right now. What is happening is a web container boots. The web container itself is set to start a CLI in the browser. Um, and this is actually done and dictated by the StackBlitz RC file, just to give you some insight into what's happening here. We can say that right when start StackBlitz loads this, it's going to install the dependencies that are in the package JSON. Um, the compile trigger is defined by save, so it's only going to reinitiate a, um, any compilation only until we hit save in the browser. Um, and the start command, you can see it's actually starting a CLI command that comes from a CLI that we install in the StackBlitz setups that starts this NS preview. So NS preview, just um, again, quick background, is it's starting um, a socket session. Uh, the socket session is uh, communicating a session ID, and it's bound to this QR code. So once you have the app, you can scan this QR code. Now I'll do that now from my phone. So you should get this uh, detection here. It will start building in the browser. So you can see that here, it's actually building for iOS. And what that means is it's just building a Webpack process. So this is Webpack building the code that's in the Stackblitz example. And then it's going to take that bundle and it's going to send it through a socket over to your device. So that's what we saw just happen here. Um, the preview app itself becomes what is in this Stackblitz. And the Stackblitz is just an Angular project. I mean, it's an Angular project with native script capabilities, right? But it, it's an Angular project. So the app module, a lot of things will be familiar to everyone here. You know, just brief primer for those that aren't uh, familiar with uh, native script. Um, probably the key things to note is that uh, the app module itself, we bring in some native script modules here. Um, Predominantly, these come from the NativeScript Angular package, which Eduardo, who's on the call, has really pioneered. Um, a lot of things in the way that the app boots and the capabilities that it takes on come from um, that integration, as well as just the NativeScript um, kind of fundamentals itself. Really what the NativeScript Angular package does is provides all the Angular conveniences on top of what NativeScript already provides. So fairly slim in the scope of that. But everything else is kind of as you'd expect, um, Angular routing. We've got a component that we are going to route to, and this is just a simple example. So it's just a, a component called talk component, and it has a reactive form group bound to it, and it has a form control name here uh, bound to a text view. So I've just got this set up just for a fun example. For those of you that, um, I do have the app installed, you can scan this QR code from the screen that's being shared. So if, if you want to try that uh, while, while I'm going through this, 
there is an audible uh, part to this. And if you make sure that your phone's audio is turned on, make sure that's not turned off, and then make sure your sound is turned up, uh, at least a reasonable, reasonable bit there. And then, um, yeah, you can see as people join, the phones that are actually connected to the session start showing up in this list. Hey, I and see Jordy. You can, once you have it loaded um, and you've made sure your volume is on and uh, the mute button is not on, click that talk to me button. Okay, and we I can actually see it worked here through the logs. Um, so uh, for Jordy, who may have just tried that there, you should have heard, and, and you might just give us, you don't have to speak if you don't want to, but maybe just a hands up that you heard that. Uh, did you hear something out of Jordy? Hey. <laughs> hey. So uh, th just right there, okay, um, kind of a lot to talk about in the scope of just that right there. Um, but I think probably the, the best place to start is, um, kind of looking at uh, just this talk component and just briefly what's going on here. We're gonna get into some other examples here, but this is just one I wanted to start out with. Um, the form group itself is what's bound to this text view. Um, again, nothing special there. The only thing that's different is um, the view. Hold on, view can I ask you a question, Nathan, about this before you yep. go into that? This can we so we can all use this preview. If we're working on a native script app, we can use this app to preview our own because when I was working on native script, I had to go through a lot more issues to get it on my iOS app. So this, I can use this, like if I'm doing this with my own app, that easy? That's, cor that's that correct. That's like two seconds. Um, right, I know. It used to be so a Jor lot more work. <laughs> oh, it's, it's a lot of work to set up. Um, well, any native platform tooling can be pretty heavy, but yeah, I mean, mobile development's always had, you know, some, some dependencies you gotta work through and, so yeah, I mean, th this is definitely, Jordy, I don't know if you've ever run mobile development before, but, um, Pavel, I you know, you that's- Pavel, I think you need to download uh, the, the preview app. The, so so native, script, native Script put out this app and we download this app and then we can preview any of our own work through that app with the QR code. But how do we then generate the QR code? I'm sorry if I'm- So, no, 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 no this is good. So yeah, two, two ways to look at preview. Um, Preview from StackBlitz uh, works the same way as it does locally. So uh, you can also run NS Preview. That's a CLI command uh, locally on your own project outside of the scope of StackBlitz. And that with the latest um, NativeScript CLI, you know, if you've got the latest installed, NS Preview will work. It will do exactly locally what it's doing inside of StackBlitz. So it, It'll it would give actually- It'll the QR code and then you- It'll yeah, give you the QR cool. code in, in the actual terminal. So um, we're just seeing it as a convenience here in StackBlitz, but if you run it locally against your project, it would actually generate a QR code in the terminal and you can scan it and it'll work just like it's doing here. Um, there's hotkeys in the CLI. So even locally, when you have it run, you can press the R key on your keyboard when the terminal is active and it will restart uh, the app on your phone. S, for example, would reset the preview, and we'll probably do that um, in a second here. But let me do something kind of fun. For those that are connected, Tim, uh, Tim, is yours connected and it's uh, working? Were you able to hear the audio? Yep, it worked great. All right, so let me, I'm going to change your voice now to a Spanish speaking voice and um, give it just a moment. It should uh, refresh and then uh, hit uh, talk to me again. Oh, hang on a second. So let me restart this right here. So as we were sitting here talking, um, my device. And if anyone else background. wants to download that app while we're here. Yeah. So Feel actually, free. scan this one more time, Tim, right here. And this is something that we're probably gauging during the public beta period. If you notice this public beta tag. Um, a lot of things around like the session duration, automatic timeout due to inactivity. Those are things we're kind of gauging through public beta is to kind of the right balance there. We don't want to keep sessions going forever um, just because we don't want to cloud up the socket connections, but uh, we'll find sort of the right balance there. But now if you do talk to me, you should hear it in a slightly different pronunciation. Does it sound sort of Spanish? It does. Speaking? 
Okay. So that is, um, you know, just flipping the different languages here on the voice utterance API. And uh, I can switch that to Australian um, just by switching these here. If that reloaded, you should be able to play it again and it should have a slightly Australian accent this time. And I don't know if, if, yep. if anyone has it working that can hold it up to the phone. I'm connected to Reflector, so it swallows my audio. Otherwise, I would uh, play it up here and you could hear it. But if you want to try to hold it up to your mic. I'll give it a shot. Thank you for joining Angular Nation to talk with us about native script. <laughs> so, um, Do I have to sign yeah. into the app to, pre to use it? You do. So that is a requirement. Um, it, it was a, a late requirement that came in, but yeah, th there is a login required. Oh, okay. One of them was actually to help get around um, App Store guidelines, typically for features that um, are going to swap components or, or do some of these features usually bound to an account is a safer way to go. But uh, also, Probably um, there will be some things I think unlocked through different account uh, access in the future. Makes sense. Um, so anyway, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna now reset. Yeah, okay. So you got disconnect. No one's connected anymore. So I'm gonna shut this down. So in the terminal here, this terminal window works just like your VS code, just control C and it quits the terminal there. If I wanted to start the session again, same command that I would run locally uh, on my own local project NS preview starts the uh, preview session here. The only difference again in stack blitz is we get the QR code here. When you run it locally on your machine outside of stack blitz, you would actually get the QR code in your terminal. It's very cool. So. So just to get a, a beyond just um, looking at that. So this is coming from, of course, Apple developer docs. So I think one of the more astounding points that can't be underemphasized is that, you know, for most um, web developers, at least, they're used to going to Mozilla, you know, or the JavaScript spec and um, or the Angular docs and looking at what's available there. And typically, you know, you're, you're, you're bound to what's available in the scope of JavaScript language um, libraries that are available and that sort of thing, which is huge. On top of that, with NativeScript, now you get additional doors opened in terms of APIs, which means you now have access to everything in the Apple Docs on top of Mozilla, Node, and all that stuff. So it is rather overwhelming in that sense because um, there is sort of an infinite level of things you could do now. So AV Speech Synthesizer is coming straight from um, the Apple Docs. And that's actually what we're using here. It is all strongly typed through TypeScript. So if we actually click this, you can see this loads um, type declarations that come from NativeScript itself. One of the one of the common points that come up uh, around NativeScript is, well, where did that symbol come from? This that is a, a common question that's come up over the years and. In Xcode for iOS developers, a lot of times you don't have to import a framework to work with it. It depends on exactly where it's coming from, but a lot of symbols are just accessible to you when you're working inside of Xcode. And so historically, the developer experience with NativeScript is meant to match that, similar to what you would get in those um, environments. And so you can just access AV Speech Synthesizer it is available to work with right away. We initialize an instance of that. Um, you can do all of the standard iOS development type of patterns, which one is delegate handling. Um, you know, whether you're super familiar with that or not, I wouldn't get too deterred by it. Um, all kind of platforms have their own sort of characteristics. They're almost like um, design workflow philosophies in a lot of ways. Um, but delegates have been around in iOS programming for years, since the early days. Um, but they sent, they're mainly objects that communicate around events uh, back and forth. And you can um, conform to different what they call protocols. And those protocols give you certain methods uh, and basically callbacks. Um, and this is an example of one. So AV Speech Synthesizer Delegate 
is something that actually comes from the Apple docs. If we were to look inside here, this delegate uh, mentions it right here, which is the AV speech synthesizer delegate. And if we click on that, we can actually see it describes what it does, um, what its purpose is, responding to speech synthesis events. All of these are callback methods that adhere to that delegate. And so because NativeScript enables all of this um, rich development, you can do those things here, um, you know, right inside this Angular component. Um, so this is one that's actually bound to that protocol. And we're actually wiring up those callback events straight from Apple Docs um, to let us know when did the speech utterance begin? Um, when did it finish? And I'm actually using that in the data binding to Angular in this example, because when it talks, the stop button shows up. When it's done without touching anything, the stop button goes away. Well, the stop button is bound to Angular. Um, and that's coming from this call right here. So did finish speech utterance is a callback that gets invoked from iOS APIs and it calls back. And because we're kind of following um, kind of iOS patterns here, this is one that's again, a pattern that uh, I think a lot of iOS developers have, have been accustomed to for years. And it probably looks a little strange to most um, web developers, JavaScript developers typically, but um, init with owner is sort of a common strategy to initialize a delegate while giving it a weak reference back to its caller, if you will, right? And its caller is the talk component in this case. Um, now we're getting, we're getting fairly detailed pretty quick here and not to go off the rails, but um, this, is, this is just sort of an example of some of the power that you have at your disposal that's there for the waiting. Um, if you want to use it, um, yeah, did, uh, Tim, did you want to interject there? Uh, Tim, did you, uh, did you have a question there? Oh, yeah, it would help if I unmute. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so essentially what you're saying is we can go into the Apple Docs, find uh, existing APIs, build that functionality into our native script apps. And as long as we're following the documentation and learning, like you said, we'll have to learn potentially delegates or other things, but fairly simplistically, we can get Apple specific features working in a native script uh, app without having to import a bunch of extra things and write Objective C or build plugins. Correct, correct. Wow. And the, the advantage here, right, is that, you know, if you've been working on the web for a while, if you open Xcode and try to work in there, it's extremely foreign. I'll be honest, I've been around iOS for quite a long time. And I mean, it, it's, it, it still feels foreign to me when I get into Xcode. So it's, uh, you know, it's a level of comfort, right? And, uh, you know, what NativeScript tries to do is bring kind of all of that goodness together and give it to you in the style that you're comfortable with. Um, which if you're comfortable with JavaScript and TypeScript, um, NativeScript is going to feel very natural because uh, it is just TypeScript. Um, but yeah, where those things come from are from the platform docs. And so just as we're doing that for iOS, you can do the same thing for Android. You can go to Android docs and pull anything from there too. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's a lot to work with. Now, Beyond that, I think in the same vein, it's always important to know that, that the web has a ton of APIs um, that can do a lot of things that are even on iOS and Android platforms too. And so it comes down to a lot of times is um, kind of just deciding what you want to use. Um, if you find a web API is not working for you, you can dive into iOS and Android docs and probably find something that will work for you there and vice versa. So it's really a matter of versatility and options more than it is one way and not another way. Um, and I think a lot of times during development, that's, that's uh, really what becomes uh, nice, you know, with development is you want to, you want to be able to develop things without limitation. And so you, you just have uh, more open doors uh, here with a lot of things you can get into in different situations. Um, if we transition this now, I won't go into too much detail on this, this example itself will probably share in the, in the coming weeks with the, um, Kind of a brief blog post that maybe describes some other details about this but for example while i was touching on um you know 
kind of that decision point between what in the web world do you want to use versus what in the platform world do you want to use and where does it matter? Why does it matter? Um, it usually matters when something is just not available. And like a good example of that is, is uh, a new API that iOS just came out with. And, and iOS is doing this all the time, right? Like um, they're innovating on APIs all the time. Um, and Room Plan is a, is a very exciting new API in iOS 16 that's very unique. Um, you know, if you're doing this type of development for a client or for an employer, this is like an example of something that, that may be hard to find. Uh, in the web world. Um, I don't know if something exists like this in the web world currently, it may. Um, and if it does, definitely like ping back and, uh, you know, let us know. But um, there's always like nuances, you know, because maybe some some feature in the way that the platform's implementing that is unique uh, to what they're doing. And maybe you just want to integrate with that specifically. So room plan, let me just refresh this page. And So this is uh, kind of a whole encapsulated like feature set that they brought where you can scan a room and it'll pick up all the shapes in the room, create a 3D model for you on the fly, uh, allow you to save that file, and then you can totally do things with that file. Like you could paint the walls, you can uh, do all the move things around. You can classify things like surfaces and um, there's a lot of neat features to it. We're just gonna show one aspect of it and this will illustrate sort of another point of versatility um, to native scope. So I'm gonna go to local dev now. So we're, we're gonna hop out of stack blitz and, um, and I'm gonna try this with reflector going here and touch on a couple interesting points here with uh, kind of what is possible and probably some aspects that hadn't been touched on a, a whole lot, which is integrating with other platform uh, developer talent. For example, there's a ton of talented Swift developers out there, uh, a ton of talented JavaScript developers out there. And uh, another point of what NativeScript tries to say is, hey, um, let's use the best from everybody. And if you've got skills there, let's, uh, let's try to use everyone's skills instead of one skill over another. Um, and all skills are useful in the scope of, um, you know, any type of development that you're building. There's a lot of useful things out there. So it's, it's nice to have uh, talent from a lot of different angles. Um, this room plan example, we'll touch on that a little bit. So let's see if I um, get this started here. Are you going to do that on your phone? I'm going to freak I out. I am. If you're gonna do, just, uh, just like that. So I think... I, just like that. So I, I am, um, I am going to run room plan iOS 16. And just so you know, this is not even released yet. Um, I don't do think we, this is going to release. Uh, okay. How do we do this? <laughs> is this like something we can download? Give it to me. I want it. It's cool. <laughs> so I'll touch on this. Let me, um, let me turn my light on because it, it does, uh, it wants good bright surfaces. Let me turn the light on for a second. And, um, I'll and show is this you how something this works, that we can so. play with, or is it, we need to wait for it to come out? Well, you could if uh, I'll, I'll I'll touch on kind of beta software and, and dealing with that, and uh, it's something anyone can deal with any time if, if they have like an Apple account, for example. Um, but let me show this for a moment. So you're gonna see my dirty office face, um, but I am not bashful. So we want. Uh, let's see. <laughs> so I'm gonna do scan room. Um, this is going to prompt for device access and we get this here. So I'm going to start scanning the room. Okay. And it starts picking up the walls. It picks up where the keyboard is there. Um, scanning around it's, here. Look at this. The bottom of the screen is like building a tiny little. It's building a model. And um, wow. so I'm just going to pick up that for right now. I'm going to do done. And we get this model here and it's now fully interactive. So um, this is like an example of something that, you know, iOS has a ton of talented developers too, and they're working on really neat stuff. And so again, an aspect of NativeScript is, well, let's work with that as well in the scope of our JavaScript projects that we're working on and not be limited um, there either. Um, what, what this is gonna do um, is kind of allows you to save that model. Um, so I could go up here and hit save and it'll allow me to enter in a, well, you can see it on the screen. Um, 
save the 3D room model and give it a name. Now, I intentionally created this for today to show you some versatility here because what's going to happen is we're not going to get that model saved. And it's because of uh, a certain way that this is created. So what should happen is it should save the model, the modal should close, and it should confirm that we saved the model. And, and then you'll have like an any... object in your Correct. JavaScript? Correct. That's, that's right. And you, you'd have this model you can then open and totally um, continue to experiment with. So, so cool. the reason that and, and we didn't get an error in the terminal. So th this is like a good example of like um, probably a stumbling point in um, native script, I think in general is like things like this. So what do you do? Well, this is sort of the versatility here. So this is coming through a room plan integration plugin that I wrote that looks and no joke, it is that simple. Um, so this is a JavaScript class. Um, it is using some native script APIs that are built in and have been, been built in for years. Um, create native view is uh, instantiating a room plan view. And then we just uh, basically wire to that what we want to deal with. Uh, we wanna be able to start the session. We wanna be able to stop the room plan scanning session. And then we wanna be able to export that file. Well, when I hit save right there and we went to export that file, um, we have, uh, a little bit of a problem there. And it's something that actually in Xcode, we would actually see what that error would be. And it illustrates an interesting point about this. So Swift right now with room plan, um, they have in the beta period, it's um, kind of enveloped in Swift. And so I'm gonna show you an aspect that uh, not a whole lot have touched on perhaps before. But for every native script project you get, every platform it integrates with, you get a platform project um, created for you that's generated all the time, which means you can open and work with that anytime as well. So in a side window, I'm gonna leave this terminal open. Um, in a side term, I'm gonna open this Xcode project. So here we're gonna enter into foreign territory for a moment, right? And uh, I just wanna cool, show this. Nathan. I just wanna show this because um, Again, don't get too sidetracked on the details here um, because really um, I'm just trying to illustrate the versatility at your disposal uh, at any time. So for example, all plugins that are loaded into native script are actually listed here in Xcode for the project that we have open. Okay, native script core itself is actually a plugin, which means we can actually open and even modify some of these files here. Room plan is a plugin that I wrote and this actually uses some APIs here. Um, and what's happening is that we're actually getting, um, let me go back here. I'm gonna run it actually fully in the scope of Xcode just to show you the error itself. And um, so let me run this here. So room plan is something that you wrote for yourself kind of just to play with. You're just pushing the envelope to see what you can do for fun. But yes. okay, but here's the question. And I don't want to push my luck, Nathan, because I know you're saying this is all brand new and it's not qu com quite completely released yet. But I'm just asking for all of us, is this something we can play with just for fun or is not done yet? So I'll, uh, I'll describe that in just a sec. I, there's nuance to that. Um, there's I nuance to that. In terms I know I'm pushing my there luck, but it's just so cool, Nathan. <laughs> There's nuance in terms of that because of um, probably more Apple specific details because you do have to be an Apple developer account, which is, which is ninety nine. Yeah, yeah. It is okay. ninety nine dollars a year. Um, I think I but, left uh, it so I wasn't using it. So if you have the Apple developer account, then theoretically you would share that with us. That's right. So just for again, fun. What I'm, what I'm, what I'm getting at here is um, again when you're working in this realm and. Um, you can at any time kind of dive in these different areas to get more detail. And so, for example, we were trying to save this 3D model and nothing was happening and we didn't get anything there. A lot of times that can be related to just the implementation. So the implementation itself, whether it's a third party vendor, uh, SDK that you're working with, or you know, it's just third party code, open source out there. 
um, we want to get full detail. So we're open Xcode just to see what, what, if we can get any more detail here. So I'm going to save this model again here. And, and you're doing that saved. with a regular iPhone, normal camera, no special. That's just cool. Yeah. So the, the, uh, so we see the error here now and it says URL invalid file extension. And sure enough, there's no file extension on this at all. It's actually just called my room. Cause that's what I called it right in the dialogue. Mm -hmm. Well, this is, illustrates like the importance of reading technical documentation um, because in the room plan API, they talk about this, that um, the only thing that export generates is a USDZ file. So when you export a file, it actually expects a USDZ file. Well, we didn't give it any extension, so it needs an extension to know what kind of file that is. Furthermore, this illustrates an issue in implementation because we would actually prefer to have that error in our Navescript code. We'd like to get it in JavaScript, right? So um, if you're working on a diverse team and you've got Swift talent on your team, you can actually integrate the two together and you could say to your Swift developer, hey, we're not getting any errors back on that. Can you give us something to give us the errors back on that? Um, and so we'll add something here. So I'm, I'm going to do this in Swift, but I'm going to do this to illustrate, um, again, a point of native script that uh, maybe is not illustrated too much, which is how quickly you have access to that. So I'm just going to add a callback here. And without explaining Swift syntax, we're adding a, a, a different argument here, and it's going to allow us to get the error back. And then down here, when this error occurs, you can see that um, we get this uh, log printout right here. That's where this error came from, and it printed the error. Not only do we want to print the error, but we actually want to send that uh, back. And that allows us to actually get that error, OK? Now, because this is actually linked source-wise to our NativeScript project, if we were running our NativeScript project still in the CLI and we hit Save, this would actually live uh, trigger a reload on the app, and we would actually get those new API changes immediately. No, no other thing you need to do. You all of a sudden now have a new argument available to you um, from this integration. So kind of illustrate that. What I mean is, um, so what we're doing is we're calling that API. So this export results, we're actually calling it from TypeScript right here export results with file path callback. Now, the, the neat thing about NativeScript to understand is it has like default rules on uh, platform APIs. And typically the rule is it's always gonna take the name of the argument and it's gonna bring all of the arguments together and make it a single callable JavaScript function. So anything in native land that you wanna call, uh, especially from iOS, for example, it's gonna take the name of that function. It's going to append with on it and that differentiates basically the function name with the arguments and so we get re export results which is the beginning of this function and we get with and then the rest of the name of the arguments so file path callback in each argument as it appends it it capitalizes the argument and that's just to differentiate the structure of the argument call so export results with file path callback well, we just added a new argument there. Let's say our Swift team did that. We don't have to wait for them to version bump that or bring that back into our project. We can use that like right away. They can just push that up. We can pull it into our branch and we can use it. So if we follow those same rules, we can use that. So error callback, we get that here. We can actually get the error. We can use typical Java syntax and we would get the error here and we can just print that. now. Important key point about NativeScript, and this is the part that's not touched on as much. We're dealing with strong types here, right? That's why we're getting this red here because we generated types with our room plan set up already. Well, we just added a new callback, but we hadn't generated the types for it yet. You can or cannot, totally up to you, depends on your development style, depends on what's going on at the time, but you can just as easily do this. This will actually work. This will work because this is actually calling the API that exists in JavaScript, right? So if we were to do this now, now I'm gonna do this and then generate the types as well, just to show you kind of, uh, kind of some details of what's happening here. But so kind of quick 
surface area touch, what did we do here? Our Swift, uh, our, the talented Swift developer on our team, right, added this error callback. You know, the, uh, we're working on a NativeScript app together. We're using the talent from both people. We've got great TypeScript developers. We've got great Swift developers, and we're, we're collaborating. You know, and, and so we're like, we need, we, we want to get some error feedback, you know, when this thing happens. So we added this error callback for us. We can use it right away. Instead of generating the types, which is, which is very quick, but I, I, I'm doing this just to illustrate an interesting point here, is that this is available right away. So again, they pushed, they pushed it, we pulled the branch, um, and this source lives inside of our native script project. So we, we have it. So now let's run that. So I'm going to go back over here and run this. And um, when this runs now, I understand out, why Tim was nerding out about all the latest stuff that you guys have been doing. Well, <laughs> I mean, uh, the uh, sort of the interesting the, the interesting stuff about all of this is it's it has been around um, a while. I think the there's topics with NativeScript that um, go into all sorts of angles and. I think traditionally over the years, there's been a certain degree of angles that have been talked about. Um, and all these other angles have always been there, but they've just maybe been talked about less. You know, this aspect of collaboration with platform developers and sort of the infinite degree of, of being able to deal with it at moments notice is something that probably hasn't been talked about as much. Um, but uh, I, I think it's one of the neater parts uh, about you know, the integration. Cause I, I think it's just awesome to be able to collaborate with different people, no matter their, their backgrounds. And, you know, there's no reason JavaScript developer can't collaborate with a Swift developer. Um, you absolutely can't. Um, so th I'm just going to do this again. Um, Akila also had a question. Uh, what happens if you use type unknown? Can you? You can, like, yes. If this is like so, just playing uh, JavaScript and TypeScript, right? So you can use like type unknown and like, uh, because like it's the same thing. So the API is there, right? When you run the code, the API is there. So and the type is just like uh, so. Like to give you some insight on the type generation part. So we generate the types, uh, so the all the APIs, right? And then there is another argument on this program that generates all the APIs that export. So we can export as binary, which is what's uh, like sent to the iOS device, or we can generate it as TypeScript. So if it generates this as TypeScript, it generates the typings for you. So that's pretty much like how, how that works. I'm, we I'm don't gonna, like I'm gonna do, into that. I'm going to do that in a sec too, um, just to kind of keep not lose everyone here, because I know I, where this is, uh, it, it can be hard to lose people at this point. Um, this, so what we did is, you know, added a, a new callback that was actually purely in Swift. We accessed that in a moment's notice within seconds, within TypeScript, without doing anything extra. Um, because you couldn't and save it. That's right. And now if I do save, I actually get an error this time in JavaScript. What just happened there? Well, we had that error that was purely in platform land, right? And we now see the same error show up in JavaScript land. And um, it's because um, we just added this error callback that, that allows us to come back, which gives us that API, that callback to access here. Now, and I didn't even use strong typing for that. Um, I just used sort of the, the rules of native script to know what that uh, would be. Now, that's all neat uh, and stuff, but it's way neater when you have strong typing, right? So let's generate the types for it. So this is probably the part that I honestly have always been wowed about um, with this. Um, actually, let me let me do one other thing before I get off that point because there's something I wanted to show, and I think I just this lost. This is very cool. Hopefully, I'm not losing anybody here. I know. Um, I, I the know visuals help a lot. I know I've fussed okay, at you before good. because you 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 blow our minds and you're blowing our minds, but also you're showing us everything. This is you're doing great, Nathan. This is awesome. This is amazing. Okay. If if uh, anyone wants me to reiterate anything or go over it again, feel free to say so. Um, always with this stuff, I think you can't reiterate it uh, too much. I think it's always helpful to kind of reiterate things and um, to really understand what's going on. Uh, 
so th what I wanted to show is just um, that I'm going to run the app again. We didn't change anything, but I just want to show the nature of development of versatility that you have here that is um, eye-opening because of the possibilities it brings to the table. And that is um, oftentimes JavaScript developers, when you're working with um, platform integrations, is you're dealing with binary code a lot of times. SDKs sometimes are distributed as like a binary module sometimes when they're linked in, um, you know, to the extent that you have a diverse team with a lot of talent on it, you have source from different places, you may have Swift source, Objective-C source, all that stuff is very alive and well uh, in your NativeScript project. So, for example, we're running this project on in Webpack on a Node CLI, and we're going to open Xcode, which is actually generated for us from NativeScript. And we're going to come in here and add um, something else here. So this time I'm actually going to Can call. Can I just throw in say, a comment Tim. while you're doing that too? Um, because you keep saying if you have a Swift developer, and I dabbled a little bit with uh, with um, uh, mobile development in the, in the old days. And it is like if, if you just needed to pull through an error message, you could also, if you're not a Swift developer, kind of just stick your toe in there and figure out how to do it just enough to be dangerous. You can. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm more doing this to illustrate kind of the, um, probably the type generation in a minute. So definitely please don't get lost on the Swift details here. Um, yeah. And definitely you don't, it doesn't require a Swift developer. I'm more I'm just showing um, sort of the interaction here between how platform code interacts with native script in a way that is pretty unique. Um, so I'll make sure this is still running. Hang on a second. Oh yeah. Wanna do. Oh, is it localized description? Let me see if I can get that here. Yeah, it should be. Yeah, so I should be able to do this. Tim Baldwin's going to be famous. <laughs> Um, okay. Let's see if this will work here now. Oh, what am I missing? Uh, uh, the closing quote. Oh. After Tim Baldwin is amazing. No, it's there after the uh, error localized. Yeah, Eduardo, I don't know if it's sticking out at you. It I was, was going to um, say, Eduardo, what's going on here? Uh, yeah. Trying to see, yeah. I mean, Swift and Objective C is like way more difficult than JavaScript, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is, this is a, I think point, you have this to a good point. Do a error. Uh, error callback, and you have to use like the there is a structure error, so like uh, error open parentheses. Oh, and, like, oh, you I like stringify it. No, yeah, no, 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 no. You, you, no, he's, yeah, he's totally right here. Yeah. I totally forgot. So yeah, this that um, that for sure is what that is there. For those of you who okay. are joining the Friday social right now, we are we have native script in the house. Uh, Nathan Walker is just live coding. That's all. <laughs> so here we go. Yeah. And, and this is, um, again, not the point that I'm that I want to make here, um, really more illustrating uh, something else that we're going to see beyond this. But um, for sure, I was doing something very, very uh, silly here because I'm doing this on the fly. But um, the error callback that, uh, for example, our Swift developer on our team had done uh, just needed to type it as string because that's what we're passing back here. But um, I'm doing this more to show the interaction between the two. 
because this uh, this native code is alive and well in our NativeScript project. So again, our, our NativeScript project, we're initiating from Node. Um, it's building through Webpack. Um, it is connected to our device and it's loading this project. When it's alive, it picks up changes throughout the scope of the project. So that's not limited to just TypeScript files. It actually picks up Swift and Objective-C changes too. And um, that's really all is uh, illustrating here. So when this loads and we get this here, we'll do scan room. This is such a cool demo. And what's amazing about this is the TypeScript code, really, because there wasn't a lot of TypeScript code to engage this. And that's kind of the um, fascinating part about, uh, like, different, you know, integrations, what different teams are doing. <clears throat> um, so I'm just going to save this again and save. And you can For see those of you who Tim just Baldwin. joined the call, yes, he just did a quick zoom of the room and just created a 3D model of the room on his phone, that's what happened. And, and this, was all, um, this was all controlled through TypeScript, I think is the, uh, the main, main point to make here. We're at a juncture here where I'm showing some uh, things that NativeScript enables that isn't talked about a whole lot, which is this um, live integration between platform code. So we, uh, we've got this string that's coming back and we've got Tim Baldwin is amazing. We can also go and make changes here and um, to this code. And we can say this. Aww. And now, now we can see what happened. Our node is actually picking up that change to a Swift file this time, not to a TypeScript file, to a Swift file, which means even if we had made API changes, and this is the key point, if we had made API changes to that Swift or Objective-C code, the app reloads while at the same time generating the fresh metadata, which means that the API changes we have immediately. So if we had changed arguments, even in native land, NativeScript would pick those up immediately. Um, and you can start working with those. That is really what is probably the more astounding point. Because from a development workflow, it that is used wild to be a to be huge pain in the butt. Well, collaborating in real time between JavaScript development and native development is, is um, something that usually requires some hassles. And uh, that aspect just cannot be underemphasized. So the now, again, we made just a change there. And all we're doing is just a simple change at this point because we're just- And now hold on because the, there were a bunch of people that just joined the call. So let's just talk about what you're doing here. You're just, you're just zooming the camera around your office and it's building at the bottom of the screen. You see it's building that. Can you do like, can you do the, like the, okay. So now uh, when I save this and I get the error, we get Bonnie Vernon is amazing, right? So that happened, you know, and we're, we're talking uh, seconds here, right? So. And we're, you we're could, doing... if you continued, you could go around the whole entire room if you wanted to and do like all of it. You're just doing like a little yeah. quick one wall. Oh yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. That, that um, you can absolutely get detailed. And the more you scan the room, the more detailed uh, the model will get. But um, so I think beyond this, where I want to go, and I'm at, let's hop out of uh, foreign land here and let's get back to ground level. So back to the initial point here. Uh, we're making live changes to Swift code, saving that and it triggering reloads on our app and actually being able to get those changes and see those changes in real time on our device through our JavaScript development. And, and that is really uh, astounding. The, the live type checking, for example, is something we can also get very easily too. So if we had made changes in native land and we want to get the strong type checking, um, we can do that at a moment's notice as well by going inside of our app and we can run NS typings iOS. NS typings iOS is a very powerful command. It basically scans the entire app for every single API, including custom APIs that you're doing, like room plan that we're playing with here. And we're using all APIs from an unreleased feature in iOS 16, which uh, is from the Apple Docs here. Um, the API is discussed here. Um, we can see that room plan is in beta. So this is um, pre-release software and we're gonna generate the types. Now these types are already done. So 
what just happened is we ran again NS typings iOS. You can run that command in any native script project and it will generate a typings folder. And the typings folder contains all of your strongly typed typings. ARM64 versus x86 is not to be not to be confused. As, a, as some know, Macs now are ARM64 based with M1s. Previously, they were Intel chips with their x86. Um, NativeScript has always supported multiple architectures on the Mac. So you actually get, if there were any difference architecture wise between the chip, you may, uh, you get different for the different chipsets, x86 or ARM64. Rule of thumb, they really, I've never seen a difference between the two. Uh, Eduardo, I don't, I don't know if you have, but um, they're always uh, the same. So I always just pick the ARM64 types. Um, it's the same types in both. Um, so that uh, is just worth noting. Inside here, I'm going to look for um, room plan, which is the API we are playing with. And we can see that there are our strong types and it includes the new error callback. So if we wanted to use that, we can drop that where our project is already including it, which we have those included here. And whether you're doing it through a plugin base or you're doing it through um, your app itself, you can do all those things in any way that you want. Um, I'm working within um, the NativeScript TSC maintains these plugin workspace uh, development environments. They are bound to NX. It's a great way to develop NativeScript plugins. Um, that kind of gives you all the stuff that you would need kind of out of the box to kind of just whip something up pretty quick. Um, and these references are simply including these strong types to room plan. And so now when we go to our code, we actually get the strong type right there. And it happens that quickly. I mean, I'm talking here while we're doing it, but I'm pretty sure we went through that in about a minute or less. And that's over explaining, right? So it's, it's, um, this is sort of just a glimpse into the real time nature of working with the platform that you're on and the types of things that are at your disposal. What that leads to is, is, is big in scope because you can talk about a lot of things in that realm, but that's the main point I wanted to make there. Um, we can probably, if anyone has questions about that, that we went through, feel free to ask because we'll probably shift to Eduardo showing off, Another neat aspect that has not been talked about a lot, which is background services and what that means in the scope of the iOS platform and in particular Angular and, and how to deal with that with, uh, with NativeScript at your disposal there. Is there anything before we get off of this? Um, well, actually, just to give more relative context here. So I was talking about generating types. These types are all of the frameworks that are in the iOS docs. So if, if you were to go and browse around the iOS docs, these names uh, predicate the framework that they're in uh, for iOS development. So you could go find, say, address book, address book, iOS docs, and there it is. And it's usually the first result, right? Because, I mean, that that is the framework. So here's the address framework. If, you, if you're questioning and want to read about that framework or understand what it does, what you can do with it, that's how to find it. Um, and everything that's in here is actually expressed in TypeScript here through NativeScript. Now, these types are already included in NativeScript projects as a convenience. That's what the types uh, package is on NPM. So every NativeScript project will typically have these included, NativeScript types. That's actually what is in those. It's, it's these types right here. And as the iOS platform evolves, the TSC just generates them fresh. Um, and we've already generated them for iOS 16, for example, and those are already, so all the iOS 16 new types that they included are already there in NativeScript 8.3. Um, so once iOS 16 is released, those are already strongly typed expressed uh, for TypeScript and you can just start working with those um, when iOS 16 is released. So that's kind of how to find those. But the cool thing about the type generation is it picks up third party stuff too. And I think that's the part that um, is really neat because if, if you pull in third party code, like um, if you've ever heard of the term Cocoa Pods, um, again, because I think it, opens up. This is where you go in, this is where you deep dive 
Remember, going, we have new people deep. coming in. Well, we, we went over our time, which we don't want you to go anywhere. But remember, we have new people coming in. And if we wrap up the uh, the presentation, because I want you to stay and have time also for uh, just Q&A about native script in general, if that's possible. Yeah, for sure. Let's, let's and transition to. Last time you were here, you promised and you showed us all your guitars. So I'm reminding you, you promised you were going to play something for us. Oh gosh, I, that sounds fun. I don't know if we'll have time for it, but uh, I'm, I'm just—I'm not going to let you forget this time because I really want. To, actually, I think the last two or three times you were here, you said next time you'd play for us. I'm just telling you. Okay, okay but um, okay, so go back on this, and I just want to let you um, finish everything you want to show us. But I want to remind you that we probably probably have a lot of questions waiting. So yeah, let me let's. Uh, we're going to transition to Ed Eduardo. Um, just to conclude on the typings, typings are a convenience. Um, they're not a necessity, they're a convenience. Um, so, you know, whenever you want them and want to generate them, you can run that command and, and get them. Um, like I said, Nascript Types, it's on NPM, already has these. The only time you would do this in your own projects is when you're integrating with custom stuff, uh, third party stuff, or you're a plugin developer and you're working with new SDKs, or you're doing like what we're doing. We're working with new unreleased APIs, iOS 16, um, room plan. Um, as far as trying pre-release software on your own, um, for Apple anyway, you do have to have an Apple developer account, it's $99 a year, uh, but that does give you the ability to download like the beta versions of Xcode, which I have Xcode 14, um, beta six, I think is the latest. Uh, yeah, right here, 14 beta six. Through that is iOS 16. So when you're when you're on the developer account, you can download that, and then that's what's um, allowing me to play with you know iOS 16. And and again, Native Script's not limited there. And that's what is neat about Native Script is that it's just a platform enablement tool. So you know even if you're on pre-release software, all the same stuff works. So you can run typings and generate typings for all that pre-release uh, APIs the same. Native Script has always been nice about that. Like they provide a bridge without getting in your way. I love that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that that is a, a good philosophy with Native Script that I think is um, meant to, to uh, transcend kind of all development is be as out of your way as possible. Um, yeah. Uh, is anyone you get excited and you want to teach us everything, Nathan. This is what happens. You just go, oh, and another thing. And I do the same thing when I'm teaching. I'm like, oh, and one more thing. I want to tell you this too. Don't forget this. This is so cool. Yeah, it's uh, with like with anything, I think that feels overwhelming one step at a time. Um, we just Native need to have you more often. Tools. Well, I mean, to the extent that people are interested, I mean, I understand for sure. And for everyone that's out there, I don't think, you know, building mobile apps and native apps is, is the more common development thing. Web development is very prevalent, will always be very prevalent. Um, I think mobile development in this realm is something that takes, um, you know, usually a certain use case or something you're shooting for. And so I think it's uh, not something that is gonna be as common from, um, you know, development shop to development shop as web development. So, so web development is, will always be synonymous. But I think that, um, these things are good to know about because when you encounter the situation and you need to start getting into that territory, it's there. It's there and, and you can use it. And it used to be you either had to be an iOS developer or a web developer or an Android developer. And this is what I really like about native script is it allows you to kind of like specialize with the web, but still like you don't have to go and hire someone else for, because it used to be like you had to have an Apple developer and an Android developer on the team because they look completely different. And this way, and there there still are like the subtle nuances of each one. They're, you know, have a little bit of difference, but this is just such an easier way to, to cover all of that without going and hiring all these different people or learning all these different languages. And you still can, that's the thing is there, because there are certain very specific things in iOS and very specific things in Android and native script just kind of lets you have the best of all the worlds without blocking off any of those APIs. Love yeah. And, and that's the thing. Look, I will, I'll be, I'll be honest. I can be comfortable in Swift and objective C, but I prefer TypeScript like myself. Just, I like TypeScript. I've always, I've always liked it. 
uh, I've always liked Angular, to be honest, and that's where I want to develop. So like, it's, yeah. uh, it's really neat to be able to do that stuff um, all, all from TypeScript. What, for Eduardo, I don't know if you are queued up or want to um, transition to show what you... Uh, not, sure. not sure if we have the time for it. We have time if you have time. I have time. Well, because after the um, after the expert events, we just have the Friday social, so we have people wandering in, and this is our this is our hour when we get together every week and we just hang out and we drink beers and we socialize and we just act silly. Um, we probably okay. Just for the sake of of us, raise your hand if anyone has questions, just so we can. And I'll have you put your hands back down in a minute. I just want to see how many questions there are and how much room we have how much time we have because we can keep going okay no bad We're questions good. by the way never never a bad question so uh okay so always, we have always. plenty of time and it's friday and uh it's late for some of us so we're just chilling so eduardo show us what you got and by the way for for those of you who are joining the friday social who weren't here when we started um oh and akila's got a question so uh, if you're joining the Friday Social, we have the Native Script team with us, and they were just showing us some really cool new stuff. And uh, so they're going to show us some more cool stuff because we went way over our time, which is totally fine. And then we'll, uh, if we have time left over, we'll have questions at the end. So if you have questions about Native Script or, or even just mobile app development in general, uh, Nathan pretty much knows all of it. Okay, Akila has a question. I don't know about Eduardo. that. <laughs> everything, Nathan, you know, everything as far as I'm concerned. Go ahead, Akila. Nope. He, he made me feel more confident when he said there were no dumb questions. Because uh, yeah. I did kind of get confused with the room plan where, and the reason why it didn't work. Is that because the software that you're using to do the shapes, is that a third party library? Is that the third party library that was confused with the database was, or why you couldn't save i guess i don't know i think it was swift swift is the ios native language yeah and it wasn't the, the, this, the, this is a great question um yeah. the uh the room plan api the way they wrote that integrates with a specific type of 3d modeling um format and that format right now at least is usdz probably that's one of those things that will expand over time but because room plan is in beta and it's unreleased yet, maybe that's just their initial take. But I like with anything on any platform, probably over time, this will expand. But yeah, that that's what that was related to is that um, their export API to actually take a room capture that we captured and then export it, it requires it to be a certain format. And um, we weren't saving it in that format. This is what I love about having this group because I really like seeing like the latest really cool stuff that's coming out, but also sometimes it's not quite finished yet. And so we have to be able to compare notes and figure like, hey, does this work yet? And what's the status on this? Uh, Nathan, Natty has to go, but she wants to know if there's a GitHub link or it's, how could she peek at this? She can peek at this if she needs an Apple developer license to be able to get that room API thing. Yeah, room plan right now still iOS 16 is in beta. Uh, there's an Apple event that they just planned the other day. That's known to probably be the release date. I think it was in September, September 15th, if I'm not mistaken. Um, that's probably when they're going to release mm -hmm. iOS 16. So once that's released, then it's um, it's just in Xcode, which you can you can download. But yeah, typically that if that stuff you would want an Apple developer account uh, to play with. But that room plan, is that yours or is that, um, is, can you drop a link to it or is there a link to it for Natty? So she this, be, because there's because a link to it on chat. Uh, there's a link to it, like the documentation of it. It's there you chat. go. Yeah, okay. that's, uh, that's probably the best way to kind of poke around with it. As far as like the native script stuff I was playing with, no, I have not released that yet. Um, and, uh, I probably will as a convenience at some point later September, once it is actually released by Apple. And if you are watching this, uh, hold on, I'm going to um, put Nathan's Twitter account because it, when did you say Nathan? Uh, if you if you don't see it, then you can tweet at Nathan and go, Nathan, Nathan. For sure. On? Uh, I'm For putting sure, Nathan's yeah, Twitter be. handle in the chat, so 
you can uh, follow Nathan on Twitter and um, then harass him if you really love this. And he, it's hard to resist Nathan when you give him love and say, Nathan, we really want that. When's it going to be ready? He'll be like, hold on. I'm busy. Akila, go ahead. And uh, um, Eduardo's coming up next. We have not forgotten about you, Eduardo. Don't go away. Uh, I had two things. Um, one, I wanted to give a shout out to William Wan. I've actually, I never met him or anything, but I've read like a lot of his blogs and stuff because I was trying to learn how to animate things. And so it's pretty cool. William Wan, are you there? Can you turn your camera on and come and get your love? Because we uh, all love you, William Wan. Not yeah, just because I love him too. We all love <laughs> oh, no, him. Just Not in a weird him. way, but like, a, you know, a very professional, but yeah. we love William. Hey, William Wan. So, yeah, it's pretty cool to. I just woke up my cat. I'm sorry. Um, another thing I had to ask is that you use the term platform code a lot. Um, is that just related to using phones or is that like IOT? Cause you're talking about communication using, is that, is, does that only encompass like uh, mobile development or is that encompass like more things outside of that? Is Fantastic question. question. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, platforms uh, typically outside of web, you know, I mean, a lot of web stuff is written in JavaScript. Um, not so much so for, platforms per se web is a platform right but um when you talk about like the scope of platforms like ios iphone you know android ios and android aren't typically written in javascript originally you know they usually are written in their platform language which historically has been objective c on ios which then transitioned to swift and swift it you can think of swift i, I like to think of swift I think a lot of developers probably think of Swift the same way. It's sort of a superset of Objective-C. It's kind of syntactic sugar on top of. So um, it, in a lot of ways, the TypeScript is syntactic sugar or, or a superset of JavaScript on top of it, right? So yeah, usually when we're saying platform, um, that's usually synonymous with platform language. And that platform language often is not JavaScript. Um, and so what NativeScript tries to do is kind of bring that platform development together in JavaScript. So, so you can kind of think of them all synonymously with JavaScript. So you were saying go that, get it, get the error from the platform and give it to the TypeScript. Right, exactly. Good question, Akila. I don't know, okay. if, I don't know if that answered it, but <laughs> I think that's so. a great question. Yeah. Eduardo. It's your time to shine. Nice. Uh, yeah, so uh, now I'll be going into some, uh, oops, let me share my screen. I don't know if you can top what uh, Nathan just showed us. That's a hard act to follow. I mean, uh, Nathan did a lot of like native stuff. I'll be showing, like, I'll be trying to blow your minds with uh, English stuff, so. Ooh. Just for yeah. us. Just for you guys. So, um, so uh, the main thing, is, as I said uh, before about Angular, is just Angular is like so versatile that you can do pretty much like whatever you want with it. And uh, to be honest, I think this is why they created like the Nest uh, framework for for uh, Node or like the, the backend because uh, Angular with the like dependency injection, everything is just so good, right? Uh, and you can even, if you want, uh, use uh, AngularJS uh, on the backend if you want to, really. Yeah, sorry, not AngularJS. We don't talk about that. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's just Angular. Yeah. It's just Angular, yeah. <laughs> so uh, before, uh, like previously, uh, before like uh, we wrote the Angular integration for NativeScript, we had something like this. So we had like platform, native script, dynamic. So just like the browser, right? Uh, and then bootstrap module, it's still like deprecated. Uh, so this is normal stuff, right, for, for the browser. So I changed things around a bit because uh, as uh, we established here, like uh, the, need to, the need to script or the, the platforms are not the same. So uh, on the web, Angular lives inside the browser. And uh, yeah, sure, I can increase the font. Uh, there you go. I think that's better. So uh, Angular on the web, you can uh, like 
the document is like where you live, the window is where you live, and then that's it. So uh, you have like a very specific thing, and like if your Angular app doesn't work or like it crashes or something, not crashes, but like throws an error, the user just has to like refresh the screen and then you have like a whole new app. But uh, that's not the case for web, the way on the web, or oh, sorry, on, on the mobile mobile side, because on mobile, if, you, if your Angular app stops working, then you have nothing to do. You just like your app's going to be unresponsive. You can just say, uh, press the refresh button and it's going to refresh a native application, right? So we switch things around a bit. So to run a native script app right now, what you have to do is, uh, there is like this uh, function here that's like run native script Angular app. What what it says is uh, run everything that needs to be done on the uh, native side. So initialize, for example, the Android activities. Initialize do the UI application main or iOS. So like call all the native stuff that needs to be called. When you need to bootstrap my main application, my UI, you call this module. And then there's also like a few other things here. So like uh, you can even use a loading module right here. So let's say you want to use uh, a module that's, for example, let's say you're using App Initializer because on the web you can use, for example, App Initializer. What happens if you use App Initializer on the web? It's just going to show like a black screen, a white screen, or whatever you had like on your index uh, index HTML, for example, uh, and you pretty much can uh, just use that, right? But uh, on mobile, imagine you had like an app that uses App Initializer to load some stuff. Uh, then you're just going to have like nothing on the screen and the user would just say like, okay, the app's like not responsive. So uh, what we did is just basically a convenience here. So if your, if your main module takes uh, too long to initialize, then uh, we, we can create, you can create even like a very small, uh, a very very small uh, like loading module that just like shows a screen, for example. So you can use Angular to create like a placeholder for the rest of your application, right? So uh, a module isn't like uh, a module is just a module. So the app module is not different from any other module in your project. You can use it anywhere. So the main thing about this is that sometimes you have to use background services, right? So this is a service that I created. Uh, this one. No, this one, sorry. So uh, I created this. Uh, this is like a proxy for basically this is going to create like a Java class with this name. And this is the implementation right here, right? So it is an SMS receiver. On receive, I'll do a few things. And that's pretty much it. So I'll do like uh, on receive, I'll get the intent and do like a few few things. And then I'm going to show this. And then uh, on my manifest, Oh, manifest. So here it is. Uh, let me do this. So and this. So here it is. So this is my SMS receiver. And every time, like I get an SMS, I want it to call that. So basically, I'm intercepting all the SMS that's showing on the device, right? Okay. So this is like pretty good. This is like basic native script stuff that you can do. You can just like come here and put some log or whatever. But uh, I want to use like HTTP client because why not? Why why should I not use what Angular allows me to do? So this is a neat thing that you can do. I created a background module. So this background module is just like if you ever used uh, Angular elements, for example, or uh, for like custom uh, web elements, this is like something that you can do. It's just like I created um, uh, an ng module that has no bootstrap at all. It's just like um, this module just lives in the background, right? So if I bootstrap this uh, this uh, module, is not going to show any UI. It's just going to uh, set up a module that I then can use like whatever, like however I want. So I created this small thing here. So it's basically uh, to confess to you guys, uh, this was created like uh, in. 30 minutes before, like uh, one hour before the call, in like 20 minutes, that was like enough to, to create uh, all this. So like I created a background module. Uh, I created like this UI, just hello, Angular Nation. You can see here the uh, items. So like you can see here what's the comes here from the, I think, yeah, there you go. 
So you can see here how it's being uh, created the screen, right? I use the async pipe to show the last received SMS uh, from uh, my device here, and that's pretty much it. So uh, let's check if it works. And there you go. Every time you receive a message, it shows it here. OK. We never so, doubted you, Eduardo. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I I have, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, what's the big deal about this? So, background services live. Uh, so, these are two independent independent modules. These are two independent things, right? And uh, the background services might live uh, in a, in an app. You you don't have only your UI. Angular is pretty much a UI framework, right? It's show, it's had there to show you an UI. Uh, but uh, in many cases in an app, you're not, you don't have an UI. You have like only, uh, for example, you receive a message and this message sends a background, sends like a, an HTTP request to a server, like, okay, I received this specific message and then gets the request, the, the response, and then that's it. There's no UI. So we don't, the, this, uh, this instance here might not be alive at all times. And this is something like uh, if we look at uh, so here here is my backend right so every time I receive a message let's try again I I get from a backend right so and I even created like some helper here so this is like uh, when this Angular instance was created was at this time right so uh, let's say I kill my application, right? So the application is completely killed. There is no JavaScript running. There is nothing else. So when you run that, it's going to kill the whole application. But I send a message. And as you can see, I received it here. So this is the time of the, at, that I received the message, right? So I uh, ignore the hours because it's like in uh, UTC, right? Or whatever. So this is the time that I received the message, right? And if I open my app right now, you see that the Angular instance itself was created later. So why was it created later? Because uh, first, my background module, so I received this callback here. So I received this. I did whatever I had to do. And then uh, the Android never spawned my UI because I didn't uh, ask it to. Uh, so like the app was not open, then it didn't need it in UI. But uh, then when I opened, uh, it ran the module, so on main.ts. So it ran this code here, which is the thing that bootstraps your main module. And with that, it created this UI and it showed like the last message, right? So uh, this is how, how like the nuances of, of uh, working with uh, native platforms is that it's not only in UI and you have more stuff to take care of. You have stuff like you have these background services. You want to do like every like 10 minutes, you want to fetch some data uh, or that kind of stuff. So it's kind of like a bit of on how web workers work, but uh, not exactly because it's not like a, a worker itself. It's on the same JavaScript uh, environment, let's say. So like every time you receive that and there's also some Pretty interesting thing. So, 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 as I said before, these are two modules. You have your app module and you have your background module, and they are bringing Bootstrap on top of platform native script. And that's how Angular pretty much works. So, Angular have the platform browser, and then in the platform browser, you can Bootstrap multiple uh, things. You can even like, if you open Stack Bits right now, you can boot uh, as long as you change like the app root. Uh, the selector for the app root and bootstrap you can bootstrap multiple angular application inside the same page right so this is all like supported by angular and that's why like angular is great uh, so the interesting part is how do, how am i doing this how am i uh getting a bootstrap i'm bootstrapping my app module right and i'm bootstrapping my background module uh, right here so I'm bootstrapping my background module here. How are these two modules that are completely unrelated to each other uh, communicating? And that's the fun part. 
So I created a service that's provided in platform. Now, this is something that you don't see every day. Uh, you might see this if you're using web components. Web components actually do uh, some of this stuff. So I created this provided in platform service. This service uh, is provided in uh, essentially here, platform native script. So this is where uh, Angular will put my service, right? When you use provided in root, so this is something that's pretty uh, like a misconception that provided in root is a singleton. No, providing in root is not a singleton actually. So providing in root is a singleton uh, in the context of that this module here. So the root module, the root module is app module. So provided in root is going to create like if I used, uh, so there is another service here, which is SMS service. So this service is provided in root. So it means on my background module is going to create this service and one of my app module is going to create another service. So like this is like the, uh, this is something that's probably not very known. It is supported, but it's not the kind of stuff that you don't see uh, at all. But uh, the thing is, uh, prior to Android 12, like this is something prior to Android 12, uh, when you close the application, it actually uh, destroyed your Angular instance. And by uh, and what I mean by destroying your Angular instance, I mean it actually destroyed your root services as well. So if you had something, so this is not uncommon, right? You have like provided in root and then on the constructor here, you can do like uh, document dot uh, uh, add event listener, for example, when you create like uh, some event listener here, right? So this is like not something out of this world to do, right? So, but if you do something like this, uh, at least prior to Android 12, uh, when the user quit the application, like using the back button on, on Android, for example, this instance would be uh, killed. And if you do not implement NG on destroy here, this, this event would leak to the other instance. So when you open the app again, this event would actually leak, right? Android 12 changed a few things, so this doesn't happen anymore. But like, this is something that's, uh, and like, as I said before, it's something that Angular provides you to, with. So Angular knows that this might be destroyed. So that's why it uh, allows you to implement your ng on destroy in, uh, here. Yeah. But yeah. Quick, quick question, Eduardo. So someone asked, so if you have something you want to remain in the background, make it provided in platform and it will yeah. be safe. Yeah, in platform, uh, it's, it means like this uh, service is provide, is lives in the platform, right? So no matter like if the SMS service, uh, so no matter if like the app destroys or whatever, like you can destroy the background module, you can destroy the app module, this platform service will still be there. The only, the only uh, way that this service is destroyed is if you destroy the platform. And when do you destroy the platform? When you do hot module reload uh, on the web, so like development. During development, this like might be destroyed because like when you save the file uh, and you don't reload the 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 the, the screen, you just like do HMR. Uh, then uh, Angular itself will destroy the platform itself and then recreate things. So it's kind of uh, like this can happen, but like it's it's the kind of thing like it's not going to be just, this one is not, probably never going to be destroyed in a real world scenario, essentially. Uh, Im important detail to keep in mind there, though, um, iOS has certain rules around that sort of thing, which if they can cancel apps running in the background on their own accord based on memory consumption, that's a iOS level feature that's been in uh, iPhones for a long time. They have rules around that you can submit a certain capability in your app to have uh, support background fetch. You have to have good reasons in app review to support background fetch. Your app must have a feature, you know, that, that validates the necessity to have like background fetch. And that will lengthen the life and, and exclude it from some of the default rules that the iOS platform kind of maintains there. The time can be a very long time. It just depends on how many apps the user opens and how often they bring your app 
to the foreground. Every time they bring your app to the foreground, it may revive that and then lengthen that time period. But if you want it to be in the background for a long time, like weeks uh, potentially, um, then you would want to probably engage in some of those background modes is what they call it on iOS and it's subject to app review, yeah. Yeah, but when, it, when iOS destroys this, by the way, when, app, when we say that iOS might kill your app, it's just like it, NGO destroy is not going to run at all. It's just like closing the browser, right? So uh, you can imagine like uh, this is probably, this, uh, if you put NGO destroy on this, it's not going to be called like pretty much ever. And, but uh, this might be like destroyed uh, by iOS by closing the browser. So just, it, this can be destroyed just like as any Angular application can be destroyed by closing the browser, right? So the, the main thing is like on, on mobile, we have to, to consider that you are not only a tab on a browser, you are the browser you, like itself, right? The app is the browser and you have to handle the other things that are, that are going on in the browser. Just like a browser with like a, a single tab or yeah back in the Internet Explorer days where you had like an, a browser which is no tab, the, the tabs were not uh, supported at all. I think the, someone raised the hand. Nope, okay. Yeah, if you want to have some question on this. Mm, I have two questions. So <clears throat> if I have an application database synchronizing with server, uh, it should be better to have it on the platform, not in the root. For the second question. Yes. So here's uh, an interesting thing, right? What's yeah. what what the platform has, right? The platform has almost nothing. So you can actually, when you first create the platform here, you can provide these uh, extra providers. So for example, here you can, if you want to use extra providers here, you can like uh, do like provide something and this kind of stuff. So the platform is a very bare bones thing, right? So if you try to use here, so we can do it right now. I think this might actually crash, but let's try. Inject. So uh, so here we do like uh, HTTP inject HTTP clients. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with the new inject APIs for Angular 14. But it's just like amazing. I'm never, I'm never using constructor again. Uh, yeah. So let's see. As you can see here, it already like it showed like a blank screen because my bootstrap failed, and it fails because there is uh, HTTP client cannot be found in this uh, platform service, right? Okay. Even though on both my modules I'm importing HTTP client or like the module that's required for HTTP client run. So the main thing here is like the platform is like pretty pretty bare bones. It doesn't have services uh, that like you can't import HTTP client on the platform uh, and it's pretty bare bones. It doesn't have zone, for example, or ng zone, right? It has, uh, uh, that's like another thing. So Angular uses ng zone, which in turn use zone JS, right? And Zone.js is a is a separate thing from Angular, so this is actually some pretty interesting stuff, right? So, hey Eduardo, I'm wondering if we can uh, get to a, a quick stopping point and see because I know Nathan has to leave and a couple people have to go because we we went so far over our time. It's <laughs> been so cool, uh, but we're getting close yeah. to the top of the hour, so I want to just kind of wrap up for final thoughts, and then we can stop the recording and say goodbye, and then. Uh, if you have time, you can stay even after the recording is over and answer questions because we've got a lot of people I'm sure that would love to pick your brain because you know so much yeah, about yeah. Angular and native script. Uh, do you have yeah, any final sure. thoughts? Yeah, so let me just like go uh, over real quick what I did. So I created this background module, right? I created this uh, SMS service that sends, uh, so it's a, basically a service that has an HTTP client. It sends the information to the server. It uh, puts in a replace subject here. Uh, for like, uh, so it's uh, shown right here. So if I send a message, like this service is then, uh, so how, how essentially I did here was I created the module. So this is an ASC function. I waited for the module to be done. I got the SMS service like module.injector.get. 
So basically, I got the injector for the module. I got the SMS service. I logged that it was received. So this is all native code to get the message body, right? And then I just do SMS service, receive SMS with the message body. So this is the next here. So it sends just to the subject uh, that's on the platform service here. And then uh, sends an HTTP request and on my items. So what I did here was just, so here I just like got the service. I got the received uh, SMS as a, a subject and I used an async pipe to show here. So like that's pretty much how everything was done, right? And how we are able to synchronize both. And uh, I don't need my UI to be running to be able to use my background service here. So uh, how to do this uh, on, how would I do it? If you need something, some so logic that needs to be shared, you can use in the platform service. You can create like a single uh, service provided in root, uh, and that's just responsible for sending the information. You use the platform service just to synchronize the state between the two. And then that's pretty much it. You can just use it. And as we, as we've seen before, like even with the app closed, I'm using Angular. I'm still using HTTP client. I mean, can, I can use interceptors. I can use like whatever is needed. And that's pretty much it. You can use the power of Angular to uh, power through whatever the native side throws at you, essentially. <laughs> nice. OK, so uh, somebody wanted to know if they could have a link to the repo. And I don't think this is public yet, but Nathan said, He's going to, uh, maybe you guys can make it available because we're out of time for today. Uh, and then Pavel had a question. Um, so Nathan is answering questions over in the chat. And uh, I'm going to turn off the recording. But before I do, real quick, uh, Eduardo, can you turn off your screen share there for a second? We have a tradition here at Angular Nation. And those of us who have been with us for a while know the tradition. Uh, so before we turn off the recording, can everybody please come off mute and help me thank the Native Script team for their time? Thank, thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys, for coming around. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Thank you. All right. I see Nathan with his guitar, so stick around. He's going to play for us. I'm going to turn off the recording. Thanks, everybody.